Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and happy World Oceans Day. Welcome to another Exploring Oceans, well, excuse me, welcome to another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. All of today's conversations are all about celebrating our oceans and bringing some of the world's leading scientists, explorers, and conservationists into classrooms to introduce the wonder of our oceans and why we need to protect them. I'm Megan Modafferi from National Geographic, which is a partner with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and I'll be your host today. I'm very excited to introduce Shaw Selby, who is here with me at the Nat Geo headquarters in Washington, D.C. Shaw is a National Geographic explorer who works as a satellite propulsion systems engineer at Boeing Space and Intelligence Systems. He also created FishNet, a unique type of technology that detects and tracks illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing worldwide. Shaw is searching for innovative ways to monitor illegal fishing, for example, by harnessing the power of drones or even cell phones. Shaw represents engineers without borders, and through them, he has built homes in Mexico, solar energy projects in Mali, water, distribu water distribution systems in Malawi, and a rainwater catch system in Tanzania. Thank you so much for joining us, Shaw. Yeah, thanks. We also want to welcome our classrooms. We've got grade sixes from Miss Caesar's class at Immaculate Conception in Prince George, British Columbia. Mrs. Krause's STEM career education class from Avalon Elementary in Avalon, New Jersey. Mrs. Bannum's grade six class from E. Cole, Sir John A. McDonald School in Kingston, Ontario. Mr. McWhirter's grade sixes from St. Paul School in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And grade fives from Miss Laura Donovan in Freehold, New Jersey. Welcome, everybody. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Shaw. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to show you guys uh, some slides so you can see some pretty pictures as I talk about some of these things. All right. So, um, so my name is Shaw. I'm a I'm an explorer with National Geographic, and so that basically means that a lot of the work that I do is is focused around helping out National Geographic think through some of the problems that they're facing. Um, that the world is facing when it comes to things like conservation and stuff. But my background is um, I'm an engineer, and so this is what I did as my first job. I worked at a, as a satellite engineer, and so my satellite's sitting at the very top of that rocket that you see right there. Um, now, unfortunately, that rocket, it, uh, it did something that rockets sometimes do, and it exploded when it was going up into space. And so that satellite now is not orbiting the Earth. It's actually um, at the bottom of the ocean. So, but the the other thing that I do is I help groups um, that are dealing with conservation issues help to figure out like how technology can play a role in it. And so I travel all over the world and work with communities in some of the most amazing parts of this planet to think through how to protect some of these beautiful areas and what kind of technologies there are to to, to help out there. And part of that is working with the the people that work in those communities, the fishermen from those communities, and the enforcement people. To, to protect these really amazing and pristine parts of our oceans. And so I want to help these guys you see here that are trying to stop things like illegal fishing and overfishing or people dumping pollutants into the water or some of the other things that, um, that people sometimes do. So I, I, I figure out all these different technologies and I help people develop them and deploy them out in the field. And so I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about what some of those technologies are because and, you know, there's a good chance that a lot of you use those on a daily basis. And so the first thing is, if you see um, on the on the right there, it's a cell phone. So I know some of you guys have smartphones and uh, and cell phones, and so you're pretty aware of that. But this is a pretty amazing new technology. Just not even that long ago, like all the things that your cell phone could do, people used to spend a fortune buying all this different equipment. And so that that picture on on the left, your parents used to buy all that stuff in that picture. And it basically just did the exact same thing that the cell phones do today. Um, but one of the amazing things that that's allowed us to do is it's allowed us to make things like this Arduino. So once we get to the question and answer section, I'd like to hear if any of you guys have ever played with Arduinos or if you know what Arduinos are. But it's basically just a single board computer. And the amazing thing about those is they use all the chips and the sensors and the technology that we got out of cell phones. and, and um, they make it cheap, so you can buy these little things, and you can and you can make them do amazing stuff um, for you know ten dollars, twenty dollars, um, and now even less. Now there's ones that are selling for five dollars, 
And so one of the projects that I actually do is how you could do that um, and use it for protecting some of these amazing places. So we build these little boxes that have these boards in them, and they test the environment. So you guys may have heard things like the smart home or how people are connecting their refrigerators or their toasters to the internet so that they have these apps to be able to see what their their um, the stuff in their home is doing. Well, we do the same thing. We build the same kind of apps, but we do it for out out in out in the wild. So we could start to detect if like pollution's coming in or if there's somebody who's like illegally poaching animals out out in the wild and they they send the data real time back to an app so that we know what, what to do about it and we can actually act right there um, immediately as it's happening. And so the big project that I work on for that is actually called the Okavango Wilderness Project that uh, I've, I've talked about on some of these hangouts in the past. Um, but this year we're also going to be taking some and putting some of these technologies on the top of a glacier in Canada. Um, we'll be taking it to the, this very sacred boiling river in the Peruvian Amazon. And I'll be, I'll be taking it along the, the, the reefs of Belize um, to be taking, uh, to gather scientific information and help to better protect these areas. So another big thing that I do that, that came from the same technologies that cell phones did is, is I work with drones. And so I have a lot of, um, a lot of drones now that I go out and I, and I try and find people who are like illegally fishing or dumping pollutants into the oceans using the same kind of drones that you, know, you could buy off of Amazon or that you see um, people get for, for Christmas. And so over the last couple of years, I've done a bunch of expeditions off the coast of California and the Caribbean where we, we go and we take these drones and we fly them over these big areas of, of water trying to look for people doing things they're not supposed to do. But the great thing about flying drones over an area is you get to find, see a lot more other interesting stuff in the ocean as well. And so we've, we've found whales with the drones. We found, um, um, you know, discarded fishing nets that are just traveling around the ocean. And it's important to find things like that because if a, if a discarded fishing net is just traveling through the ocean, it's still catching fish and it's just killing those fish. And so we want to take those things out of, the, out of the ocean so they don't continue to cause the damage, um, damage that they do. And the really, really exciting thing about drones is there's so many of them out there, and they've gotten so cheap that it's almost it's a lot easier to do these kinds of things with a drone than it used to be to do it with a, a regular airplane that people had to fly around in. And some of the other work that I do involves using underwater drones. And so um, a friend of mine, David, he created this great company called Open ROV where they make these little underwater submarines. And you can see in the middle of those lights, there's that there's an HD camera in there, um, and so you you can have this go and under explore underwater, and at the same time have the video brought up, you know, real time to your laptop, and it's a pretty amazing thing. And David's doing some really cool stuff with trying to use virtual reality and and these these open ROVs, and you can imagine if you have virtually virtual reality goggles on while you're flying one of these underwater, it feels like you're actually in a real submarine. So it's very exciting stuff. And you could start to really understand what human impact is having underwater um, by having these kinds of technologies. Um, and then a lot of the other stuff that I do is I help to develop apps that help with communities and gather a lot of the conservation information that they have. And, and when they see something bad happening, they could take a picture of it. So it works a lot like you would, you know, Instagram or Facebook works, but it's just focused on finding things that are going wrong with the environment. Um, and then there's this really cool uh, technology that another friend of mine, Topher, you can see Topher in the picture right there. And what he, what Topher did was he takes these old cell phones, he takes these old cell phones and he puts them up in the rainforest. And he, the cell phones have a microphone on them and they listen to people who are trying to cut down the rainforest. Yeah. We just are getting some yeah, I want to, I want to fix real quick. Oops. Sorry about that, everybody. All right. Yep. So All right, we'll get right back into it. Yeah. So so Topher he takes these old cell phones and he puts them up in the rainforest and listens to people cutting down the rainforest. And so what we're doing is we're taking those same old cell phones and we're putting them in the oceans and we're listening for boats coming into areas that they're not supposed to go. So you know a lot of times we will close a certain part of the ocean and they call them marine protected areas. And the whole point is, if we could keep the people who are fishing out of that area, 
then allows the the fish to rebound. It allows like all the babies to grow up into big healthy adults and start having their own babies. And it, it it's the same way that you see like a national park on land work in that you know it, it kind of produces all these this healthy safe space for the animals um, so that they can kind of keep on growing. And so th one of the important things about marine protected areas is we have to try and um, make sure that they're actually protected. And it's very expensive to have somebody sitting on a boat all the time looking for that stuff. So we're hoping that you know people's old cell phones can listen for us and when they hear a boat coming in the in that area they can send us a text message or send us a note so we know that that's happening. But we're also going to you know there's going all this is going to come on an app and you'll be able to listen to whales underwater and do a lot of really amazing stuff. Um, and then another thing that, that I work a lot on is on satellites. So I know you guys have probably looked at Google Maps before and seen the amazing things you can get in terms of satellite imagery. Well, long time ago when I first started working on satellite stuff, satellites were very big, expensive things. You had to, if you wanted your own satellite, you had to pay a company you know, $250 million to get your own satellite. Well, the amazing thing is that all that same cell phone technology I was telling you about before, it's creating these things called CubeSats that you see this, this lady holding in the picture on the right. And so that's a satellite too, but the thing is that it only costs thousands of dollars instead of millions of dollars. And so if you could put those up for thousands of dollars, you could put, you could put a lot more of them up and they can do a lot more interesting things. And there's companies like Planet Labs and some of the other ones that are putting up a lot of these things to take, they want all want to take a picture of the Earth every single day. And if you keep on taking pictures of the Earth every single day, you can see <laughs> how the Earth changes. And, and, um, and if it's changing in a negative way, you can do something about it. Um, and then, and then <laughs> sorry. Yeah, let's see what we can do about that. It can be tricky, <laughs> as we all know. Oh, this one. There we go. All right. Maybe if we could. Okay. So, yeah, so, so, so there's a lot of really cool things that technology can do, and this is just an example of one of the sensor things that I built. You can see all the connections and and the different um, the boards and all that stuff. That's all stuff that you know now you could just buy it off the internet and and they come to your house and put them all together and then all of a sudden you can do the same capabilities that you know I went to university for to learn. People are learning it now on the internet and doing some incredible stuff. So um, I wanted to just kind of cover things for um, for 15 minutes, but. But basically, you know, we're in this really amazing time in which technology can really impact the future of our planet and help us do some incredible stuff. And so there's stuff that even you guys could do um, this weekend if you wanted to, um, based off of this, that would really help us to better protect the planet moving forward. So um, if, you're, if you think into the future and what you want to be when you grow up, if you want to help the planet, it's not, you know, you can be something other than... Uh, a biologist or a lawyer or one of those people that traditionally help the planet. You could be an engineer now and do a lot of really, really cool work. So. Great. Thank you so much, Shaw. So we'll go ahead and stop sharing our screen so that we can take questions from all our classrooms out there. So we're going to go first to Miss, Mr. P. Witt. Wickwerder? McWerder? I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe you can introduce yourself and then have your students answer, ask their question. Do you have a question? Anybody have a question? Uh, wait, one person. You have a question there, Angela? Mm -hmm. You know, I do, I, we, live, we live on the biggest freshwater lake in the world, Lake Superior, and this is intriguing, Shaw, because I think to myself, maybe we can implement this kind of technology in the Great Lakes, which are faced with all kinds of problems now, uh, invasive species, pollution. So it's, it's, to me, it's really intriguing. Uh, the potential that this holds. Yeah, they, there, there's actually a lot of um, um, interest right now to try and use those like little computers that I was showing you, the Arduinos, to try and and look for invasive species there. So I know you know the 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 carp is a big problem in in the Great Lake Lakes, and there's lots of people that are worried about it. There's people that are making these little sensors um, that cost you know fifty dollars or something to be able to sense the, the the temperatures and the changes in the lake that would mean like when the when the environment this the lake is changing in a certain way that's going to be ideal spawning um, 
uh, times for the carp, and then they can try and find those eggs and like stop the carps from from hatching and doing a lot of that that stuff. So yeah, you could definitely do a lot there. Interesting. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask. We're live, so if you're gonna ask, ask. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Do you have like a drone flying over Lake Superior to like make sure that there is no Yeah, yeah. You can definitely fly a drone. I've never flown a drone over Lake Superior. I've drone flown it over other lakes, and a lot of the work that I do is has been over um, over the ocean or on like you know small islands in the middle of the Pacific or in the middle of the Caribbean. Um, but the same kinds of things that I look for there, you can you can look for um, in, in your nearby lake for sure. Great. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go to Miss Caesar's class. Mrs. Caesar's class, I'm turning off your mic, so whenever you have, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, um, hi, so what made you want to do all of this? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. So. I, you know, I was one of those nerdy people when I was a kid, and I knew I wanted to be an engineer from when I was look, very young. Like, I, I would, I used to take apart all my dad's electronics, and instead of getting in trouble for taking them apart, he would show me how to put them back together, and that, like, that basically turned me into an engineer when I was a kid. And so I knew I wanted to do that, but I always thought that engineering had this ability to do a lot of really good, a lot of good in the world, and I didn't want to spend my whole life behind a desk. And so it was when I was in graduate school that I, that I started working with an organization that was called the Center for Ocean Solutions. And they were thinking through these massive problems that the ocean has, but they had never had an engineer help them think through some of those things. And so I was the first one, and that's, that's where I started to see um, some of these opportunities. And then I saw, like, you know, there's all these problems, all these people working on ocean stuff, but nobody's looking at it from an engineering standpoint. Like, you know, some of the problems that they're, they're talking about have been solved in the way FedEx ships packages, or it's solved in the way that some, you know, Silicon Valley company acts in a certain way, right? And so I started bringing in all these solutions and working with them, and you know, one thing led to another, and and now I'm an explorer for National Geographic. <laughs> Great question. Okay, I'm gonna go to Miss Monahan's class now. Whenever you're ready. Protect. Do the cell phones stay well protected when they are recording in the ocean? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. That's actually what a big part of the engineering around it is, is we have to figure out how to design the housings so that they keep out things that destroy electronics, like water, salt that's in the water, um, any kind of weather issues. And so we, we build these special housings, and, and we use 3D printers to build them first, and then once they're kind of good enough, then we, we get someone with big machines to help us build more stronger versions of them. But like it works in a lot of ways that a pelican case is, if you've ever used a pelican case. It keeps water from coming inside, but still allows it to have access to you know sunlight for a solar panel and the wires to come out um, that are sealed. But yeah, that's a very hard, that's a hard problem. And, and some of my systems, I haven't quite figured it out yet, we're still we find new uh, new ways to um, to make them stronger. Like a perfect example is the one in the Okavango, which is in Botswana. So it's in the middle of of um, of the sub-Saharan Africa, and there's lots of big animals around that. And I found out on one deployment that um, that hyenas are attracted to LED lights. And I found that out because I had LED lights on my sensor, and a hyena came in the middle of the night and ate my sensor. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mrs. Krause, we're coming to you now. Go ahead and ask your question. You got a question? Go ahead. Can you hear us? Yes. Do you have a team that helps you building? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I do. I can't. I can't do all this stuff by myself, and so I have some other engineers that help me. I have people who are not engineers that are just excited about this and they want to learn. Um, so there's a there's a, a group of people that come and do it and, and and right now I have a nonprofit that is doing this kind of work and so I'm hiring more people I'm bringing interns in to do stuff for the summer and we um, and and then people who can kind of go out on a lot of these expeditions so I'm not constantly traveling. Thank you. Okay, Miss Bannum's class. We can't see you, but I think we should be able to hear you. So we're gonna go to you. Let me just open your mic. 
Okay, we can hear you. Have you ever heard of the sea bin? Of the what? A sea bin? No, it, wait, is that that little trash can that it sucks in the... Is that what that is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I saw that. I saw that. I think I saw that on Facebook or something, but it's, it, it, it's really neat. It's, it, I, the thing I really liked about it was that it, it uses the own forces of the water to pull the trash in, and so it's like it's barely floating in right underneath the surface of the water, and it pulls all that, that stuff in. That's a great idea. I, when I saw it, I was very excited about it. Thank you. All right, well, we have a little bit more time, so we are going to come back around. I'm just going to choose randomly. Um, to, maybe we'll get to everybody for one more question, but how about going back to Mrs. Caesar's class again? I'm opening you up. Um, what was your hardest project? Ooh, what was my hardest project? That's actually a really good question. Um, I think the hardest project I've ever had was the one that I, I talked about in in, um, in Botswana, and, and that's just hard because it, it's a it's one system that is supposed to work across three different countries, and so that's like that's a very big system. It takes a lot of work to get it right and make sure everything's uh, working correctly. I think that was really that one's really hard from just a scale standpoint. I think I've also done some some projects with drones that have been very difficult because um, the weather in the places that we were flying the drones was just you know very high winds very heavy rains, and it's hard to, to fly a drone there. I've, I've lost a bunch of drones that have crashed into cliffs or, like, fallen into the ocean, or we have to jump in and grab them. Um, so, so, yeah, that's that's been pretty hard. Okay. How about Mr. McWhorter's class? Do you have another question? Anybody else? Charlie? Um, Boy, just speak. Um, who were you inspired by to be um, an who was it inspired by to what? To be an engineer. Be an engineer. Um, so I, you know, I was probably inspired um, mostly, I said earlier, like by my dad and the way that he taught me how to put things together. He wasn't actually an engineer, um, but he knew a lot about technology, and, and so he kind of taught me that. But I, you know, I always really liked the story of the people who were like the first people to do something, you know, like you know, like the Wright brothers and, and their first flight. I liked all those kinds of old stories of people developing and inventing. I liked inventors. I thought inventors were neat. Um, so, so, so a lot of the famous inventors out there inspire me. People like, you know, Leonardo da Vinci or Nikola Tesla, you know, a lot of the people who have kind of changed the way that we see the world. I think the amazing thing that an engineer can do is, is you know, if we want to create something that doesn't exist, like that's that's what engineering is. It's dreaming something up and then building and creating something that the world has never had before. Um, and you could, if you do that for for good reasons like conservation, it can have amazing impacts. And so, okay, I think we have time for one more. I'm going to Mrs. Krause's class. Um, so you fly drones over the ocean. Uh, how long is the battery life on most of them? Yeah, that, that's a, actually a really good question. That's the, the one thing holding drones, drones back from being a really good solution is the fact that a lot of them have pretty short battery lives. So the ones, like the picture that I showed you that has the, the, the drone that looks like a plane and doesn't look like a helicopter, so that, those are called fixed-wing drones, and that's the ones that I fly because I, I can get them actually to fly long distances. And so the, the one I've gotten to fly the longest could fly for... Um, a hundred miles. That's how far it could fly. Is a hundred miles, and it would be up in the air for, I think, five and a half hours is the longest that I've flown it. So you can actually cover a lot of a lot of ground with that if if you use it um, in the right way. But that's it's a lot of flying. It's long. When I would do the test flights, I would put it up and it'd fly in circles for five and a half hours, which is a very boring thing to watch. <laughs> Okay, okay, one more, one more, then all classes will have gone twice. How about Mrs. Bannum's class? Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, what is your favorite part about being an underwater ocean engineer? <laughs> um, I, I think my favorite part is actually going on the expeditions and testing the stuff in the field. Um, that, that's, that's kind of the most fun. Uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is I love traveling to these amazing places and seeing different parts of the world. 
Um, but I also really like testing something that I've created because every single time you test it, something goes wrong that you didn't expect it to happen, and you have to figure it out right there while, while you're uh, um, in the field. And that's kind of an exciting thing to go through because you're constantly learning more. Like you're 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 always on your toes and like thinking through these kinds of solutions. Sometimes it's very frustrating, but it's but it's also really exciting. So. Well, thank you so much for all of those great questions, and thank you to all the classes who are tuned in live on the bottom, but also all the classes who are we can't see but who are, have tuned in and are watching. Um, and thank you very, very much to Shaw. This has been a really inspiring talk. And so now the last thing, I'm going to turn everybody's mics back on, and I want you to all say thank you and applaud and say bye to Shaw on the count of three. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>